Part One of Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Thomas Carlyle by Gilbert Keith Chesterton and John Ernest Hodder Williams. Part One. There are few cultivated people who do not pretend to have read Mr. Lecky's History of Rationalism in Europe that very able work covers the whole of one very important side of modern development but the picture of the real progress the real mental and moral improvement of our species during the last few centuries will not be complete until mr lecky publishes a companion volume entitled the history of irrationalism in europe the two tendencies acting together have been responsible for the whole advancement of the western world rationalism is of course that power which makes people invent sewing machines understand euclid reform vestries pull out teeth and number the fixed stars irrationalism is that other force if possible more essential which makes men look at sunsets laugh at jokes go on crusades write poems enter monasteries and jump over haycocks rationalism is the beneficent attempt to make our institutions and theories fit the world we live in as clothes fit the wearer irrationalism is the beneficent reminder that at the best they do not fit irrationalism exists to point out that that eccentric old gentleman the world is such a curiously shaped old gentleman that the most perfect coats and waistcoats have an extraordinary way of leaving parts of him out sometimes whole legs and arms the existence of which the tailor had not suspected and as surely as there arises a consistent theory of life which seems to give a whole plan of it there will appear within a score or two of years a great irrationalist to tell the world of strange seas and forests which are nowhere down on the map the great movement of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries which rose to its height in the french revolution and the positivist philosophy was the last great rationalistic synthesis the inevitable irrationalist who followed it was thomas carlyle this is the first and most essential view of his position in order to explain the matter more clearly it is necessary to recur to our image of the old gentleman whom no tailor could fit not only do the tailors tend to think that clothes can be made to fit the old gentleman but they tend very often to think that the whole question is a question of clothes thus for instance the popes and bolingbrokes of the early eighteenth century tried to make man a purer symbol of civilization they tried to pluck from him altogether his love of the savage and primeval as they might have plucked off a shaggy wig from the old gentleman in order to put on a powdered one a bystander of the name of byron who was indeed none other than the inevitable irrationalist startled them by pointing out that the shaggy object was not a wig at all but the poor old gentleman's own hair that in other words the love of the savage the primeval the lonely and unsociable was a part of man and it was their business to recognize it then arose the new fashion in cosmic clothes which did recognize this natural element rousseau and shelley took the old gentleman in hand and provided him with spring-like garments colored like the clouds of morning but one of their principles was the absolute principle of equality finding therefore that the old gentleman was wearing a curiously shaped hat compounded of crown coronet and mitre the great hat of godhead kinghood and superiority they proceeded in order to make him more natural to knock it off and to them suddenly appeared the inevitable irrationalist a scotch gentleman from dumfrieshire who addressing them politely said you believe that that regal object you are knocking off is his hat believe me gentlemen it is his head some mistakes will occur after a hasty inspection but that kingship is really a part of the old gentleman and it is your business to recognize it 
as byron had come just as the classic edifice of polite deism had been completed to point out that the fact remained that he byron did prefer walking by the seashore to taking tea in the garden so carlyle appeared just as the austere temple of political equality was erected to point out that the fact remained that he did think many people a great deal better than himself and very many people a great deal worse thus then as the asserter of the natural character of kingship against the natural character of equality it is that thomas carlyle primarily stands twenty-one years after his death now i do not think as i shall show later that carlyle ever really understood the true doctrine of equality but it is certainly at least equally true that the egalitarians and the ordinary opponents of carlyle have never done the least justice to carlyle's doctrine of hero worship the usual theory is that he believed in a race of arrogant strong men brutally self-sufficient and brazenly indifferent to ethical limits and that he wanted these men to frighten and dominate the populace as a keeper or a doctor frightens and dominates the lunatic in a cell it is not too much to say that there is scarcely a trace in carlyle's work of this barbarous and ridiculous idea if there be a trace of it here and there it is mere explosion of personal ill-temper and has nothing whatever in common with carlyle's deliberate theory of the hero his theory of the hero was that he was a man whom men followed not because they could not help fearing but because they could not help loving him his theory right or wrong was that when a man was your superior you were acting naturally and looking up to him and were therefore happy that you were acting unnaturally and equalizing yourself with him and were therefore unhappy most people except those solemn persons who are called with some humor free thinkers would agree for instance that the worship of god was a human function and therefore gave pleasure to the performer of it like eating or taking exercise now carlyle held rightly or wrongly that the worship of man of the great man was also a human function and therefore gave pleasure to the performer of it it all depends upon whether we do take an egalitarian or an aristocratic view of the spiritual world if the spiritual world is based upon equality then no doubt to keep a man in an inferior position must spiritually depress and degrade him but if beings in the spiritual world have higher and lower functions it is obvious that it is equally depressing and degrading to a man to take him out of his position and make him either a citizen or an emperor moreover the real practical truth that underlay carlyle's gospel of the hero has in other ways been misunderstood the general idea is that carlyle thought that if a man were only able everything was to be excused to him if carlyle even at any moment thought this it can only be said that for that moment carlyle was a fool as many able men may happen to be but as a matter of fact what carlyle meant was something much sounder to say that any man may tyrannize so long as he is able is as ridiculous as saying that any man may knock down people so long as he is six feet high but in urging this very obvious fact the opponents of carlyle too often forget a simpler truth at the back of the carlyle gospel it is that while in one sense the same moral test is to be applied to all men there does remain in ordinary charitable practice a very great difference between the people who consider it necessary to see some definite thing done before they die and the people who cheerfully admit that two hundred years will scarcely bring what they require and that meanwhile they desire to do nothing a tolstoyan anarchist who thinks that men should be morally persuaded for the next two or three centuries to give up every kind of physical compulsion may it is quite conceivable be more right than the english home secretary who finds himself responsible for the suppression of a riot in manchester 
but surely it is patently ridiculous to say that it is just as much to the anarchist's credit that he avoids shooting manchester workmen as it would be to the home secretary's credit if he avoided shooting them it would be equally ridiculous to say that if the home secretary conceived it necessary to shoot them from a sense of responsibility that his action even if wrong was really as wrong as the conduct of a tolstoyan who should shoot them without any reason at all in this sense therefore there is really a different test and a perfectly fair one for men of action and for men of abstract theories and remote hopes now it must definitely be set to the credit of men like cromwell and mirabeau that they were undoubtedly opposed to and embarrassed by men whose projects even in their own eyes were scarcely a part of practical politics these men exist in every country and in every age they are willfully and eternally in opposition they do not agree sufficiently with the active powers even to argue with them with any profit their ideal is so far away that they do not even desire it with any immediate hunger they count it a pleasant and natural thing to live and die in revolt they are ready to be critics they are ready to be martyrs they are emphatically not ready to be rulers in this way cromwell considering how he might make some english polity out of a chaos of english parties had to argue for hours together with fifth monarchy men to whom the vital question was whether the children of malignants should not be slain and whether a man who was caught swearing should not be stoned to death in this way mirabeau striving to keep the tradition of french civilization intact amid a hundred essential reforms found his way blocked by men who insisted on discussing whether in the ideal commonwealth men would believe in immortality or go through a rite of marriage now while fully granting that both types have an eternal value it is certainly not just that precisely the same ethical test should be applied to cromwell and the fifth monarchy men to mirabeau and the worshipper of pure reason it is not just that we should judge in precisely the same way the pace of a butcher's cart which is obliged to get to pimlico and the pace of a butcher's cart which is designed at some time or other to reach the site of the garden of eden it is not just that we should judge in the same way the man who is simply anxious to erect a parish pump and the opponent of the pump who looks forward to a day when there shall not only be no pump but no parish the man of action then really has in this sane and limited sense a claim to a peculiar kind of allowance in that it is of vital necessity to him that a certain limited grievance should be removed it is easy enough to be the man who lives in a contented impotence the man who luxuriates in an endless and satisfied defeat he does not desire to be effective he only desires to be right he does not desire passionately that something should be done he only desires that it should be triumphantly proved to be necessary this is the real contribution of carlyle to the philosophy of the man of action he revealed entirely justly and entirely to the profit of us all the pathos of the practical man he made us feel what is profoundly true that the tragedy of the death of mary queen of scots is nothing to the tragedy of the death of elizabeth that the tragedy of the death of charles i is nothing to the tragedy of the death of cromwell a man like charles i died triumphantly he did not indeed die as a martyr but he died as something which is much more awful and exceptional a consistent man he was worse than a tyrant he was a logician but a man like cromwell is in a much harder case for he does not wish to die and be a spectacle but to live and be a force he has to break altogether with the splendid logic of martyrdom he has to eat his own words for breakfast dinner and supper he has to outlive a hundred incarnations and always reject the last 
his progress is like that unnerving initiation in the wild tale of tom moore's in which the disciple had to climb up a stone stairway into the sky every step of which fell away the moment his foot had left it this is the only genuine truth that carlyle brought from his study of strong men if ever he said that we must blindly obey the strong man he was merely angry and personal and untrue to his essentially generous and humane spirit when he said that we must reverence the strong man he sometimes expressed himself with a certain heated confusion and left it doubtful whether he meant that we should reverence the strong man as we respect christ or merely as we respect sandow but we should all agree with him in his essential and eternal contribution that we should pity the strong man more than an idiot or a cripple it may be said that there is a certain inconsistency between these two justifications of carlyle's hero worship that we cannot at the same time respect a man because he is above us in a definite spiritual order and because he is in what is popularly called a whole that we cannot at once reverence mirabeau because he was strong and because he was weak this kind of inconsistency does exist in carlyle it is i may say with all reverence and with all certainty the eternal and inevitable inconsistency which characterizes those who receive divine revelations the larger world which our systems attempt to explain and chiefly succeed in hiding must when it breaks through upon us take forms which appear to be conflicting the spiritual world is so rich that it is varied so varied that it is inconsistent that is why so many saints and great doctors of religion have pinned their faith to paradoxes like the credo quia impossibili the great theological paradoxes which are so much more dazzling and daring than the paradoxes of the modern flaneur the supreme glory of carlyle was that he heard the veritable voices of the cosmos he left it to others to attune them into an orchestra sometimes the truth he heard was this truth that some men are to be commanded and some obeyed sometimes that deeper and more democratic truth that all men are above all things to be pitied it will be found relevant to what i have to say hereafter to remark at this point that i do not myself accept carlyle's conception of the spiritual world as exhaustive i believe in the essence of the old doctrine of equality because it appears to me to result from all conceptions of the divinity of man of course there are inequalities and obvious ones but though they are not insignificant positively they are insignificant comparatively if men are all really the images of god to talk about their differences has its significance but only about the same significance which may be found in talking about the respective heights of twenty men all of whom have received the victoria cross or the respective length of the moustaches of twenty men all of whom have died to save their fellow-creatures in comparison with the point in which they are equal the point in which they are unequal is not merely decidedly but almost infinitely insignificant but my reason for indicating my own opinion on the matter at this point is a definite one carlyle's view of equality does not happen to be mine but it has an absolute right to be stated justly and to be stated from carlyle's point of view it was not a brutal fear or a mean worship of force it was a serious belief that some found blessedness in commanding and some in obeying now this kind of intellectual justice was the one great quality which was lacking in carlyle himself he would not consent to listen to rousseau's gospel as i have suggested that we should listen to carlyle's gospel he would not put rousseau's gospel from rousseau's point of view and consequently to the end of his days he never understood any gospel except carlyle's gospel end of part one
part two of thomas carlyle by gilbert keith chesterton and john ernest hodder williams this librivox recording is in the public domain part two when a literary man is known to have been almost a monster of industry when he has produced a colossal epic like frederick the great on the dullest of all earthly subjects germany in the eighteenth century when he has piled up all the complicated material of the history of the french revolution lost it and by a portent of heroism piled it all up again when he has achieved such masterpieces of research as the discovery of sense in cromwell's speeches and good qualities in frederick of prussia when an author has done all this it may seem a singular comment upon him to say that his main characteristic was a lack of patience but this was in reality the chief weakness in fact the only real weakness of carlyle as a moralist it is very much easier to have what may be called moral patience or mental patience than to have something which may best be described as spiritual patience carlyle was patient with facts dates documents intolerably wearisome memoirs but he was not patient with the soul of man he was not patient with ideas theories tendencies outside his own philosophy he never understood and therefore persistently undervalued the real meaning of the idea of liberty which is a faith in the growth and life of the human mind vague indeed in its nature but transcending in its magnitude even our faith in our own faiths he was something of a tory something of a sans-culotte something of a puritan something of an imperialist something of a socialist but he was never even for a single moment a liberal he did not believe as the liberal believes first indeed in his own truth which in his eyes is pure truth but beyond that also in that mightier truth which is made up of a million lies and this spiritual impatience of carlyle has left its peculiar mark in the only defect which can really be found in his historical works of the astonishing power and humor and poignancy of those historical works i think it scarcely necessary to speak a man must have a very poor literary sense who can read one of carlyle's slighter sketches such as the diamond necklace and not feel that he has at the same time to deal with one of the greatest satirists one of the greatest mystics and incomparably one of the finest storytellers in the world no historian ever realized so strongly the recondite and ill-digested fact that history has consisted of human beings each isolated each vacillating each living in an eternal present or in other words that history has not consisted of crowds or kings or acts of parliament or systems of government or articles of belief and carlyle has moreover introduced into the philosophy of history one element which had been absent from it since the writing of the old testament the element of something which can only be called humor in the just government of the universe he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh them to scorn the lord shall have them in derision is a note that is struck again in carlyle for the first time after two thousand years it is the note of the sarcasm of providence any one who will read those admirable chapters of carlyle on chartism will realize that while all other humanitarians were insisting upon the cruelty or the inconsistency or the barbarism of neglecting the problem of labor carlyle is rather filled with a kind of almost celestial astonishment at the absurdity of neglecting it but a definite defect there is as i have suggested in carlyle considered as an historian and it flows directly from that real moral defect in his nature an impatience with other men's ideas in judging of men as men he was not only quick and graphic and correct but in the main essentially genial and magnanimous only a very superficial critic will think that carlyle was misanthropic because he was surly 
there is very much more real sympathy with human problems and temptations in a page of this shaggy old malcontent than in whole libraries of constitutional history by dapper and polite rationalists who treat men as automata and put their virtues and vices into separate pigeonholes if i had made a mistake or committed a sin that had any sort of human character about it i would very much rather fall into the hands of carlyle than into the hands of mr hallam or mr james mill but while carlyle did realize the fact that every man carries about with him his own life and atmosphere he did not realize that other truth that every man carries about with him his own theory of the world each one of us is living in a separate cosmos the theory of life held by one man never corresponds exactly to that held by another the whole of a man's opinions morals tastes manners hobbies work back eventually to some picture of existence itself which whether it be a paradise or a battlefield or a school or a chaos is not precisely the same picture of existence which lies at the back of any other brain carlyle had not fully realized that it was a case of one man one cosmos consequently he devoted himself to asking what place any man say robespierre or shelley occupied in carlyle's cosmos it never occurred to him sufficiently clearly to ask what place shelley occupied in shelley's cosmos or robespierre in robespierre's cosmos not feeling the need of this he never studied he never really listened to shelley's philosophy or robespierre's philosophy here after a somewhat long circuit we have arrived at the one serious deficiency in carlyle's histories a neglect to realize the importance of theory and of alternative theories in human affairs the standing example of this is the history of the french revolution carlyle's conception of the french revolution is simply and absolutely that of an elemental outbreak an explosion of nature in history an earthquake in the moral world human nature carlyle seems to tell us had been stifled more and more in the wrappings of artificiality until when its condition had just passed the tolerable gagged blinded deaf and ignorant of what it really wanted by a gigantic muscular effort it burst its bonds so far as it goes that is perfectly true of the french revolution but only so far as it goes the french revolution was a sudden starting from slumber of that terrible spirit of man which sleeps through the greater number of the centuries and carlyle appreciates this and describes it more powerfully and fearfully than any human historian because this idea of the spirit of man breaking through formulae and building again on fundamentals was a part of his own philosophical theory and therefore he understood it but he never as i have said took any real trouble to understand other people's philosophical theories and he did not realize the other fact about the french revolution the fact that it was not merely an elementary outbreak but was also a great doctrinal movement it is an astonishing thing that carlyle's french revolution contrives to be as admirable and as accurate a history as it is while from one end to the other there is hardly a suggestion that he comprehended the moral and political theories which were the guiding stars of the french revolutionists it was not necessary that he should agree with them but it was necessary that he should be interested in them nay in order that he should write a perfect history of their developments it was necessary that he should admire them the truly impartial historian is not he who is enthusiastic for neither side in a historic struggle that method was adopted by the rationalistic historians of the hallam type and resulted in the dullest and thinnest and most essentially false chronicles that were ever compiled about mankind the truly impartial historian is he who is enthusiastic for both sides he holds in his heart a hundred fanaticisms 
the truly philosophical historian does not patronize cromwell and pat the king on the head as hallam does the true philosophical historian could ride after cromwell like an ironside and adore the king like a cavalier the only history that is worth knowing or worth striving to know is the history of the human head and the human heart and of what great loves it has been enamoured truth in the sense of the absolute justice is a thing for which fools look in history and wise men in the day of judgment it is the glory of carlyle that he did realize that the intellectual impartiality of the rationalist historian was merely emotional ignorance it was his only defect that he extended his sympathy in cases like that of the french revolution only to headlong men and impetuous actions and not to great schools of revolutionary doctrine and faith he made somewhat the same mistake with regard to the middle ages touching which his contributions are unequalled in picturesqueness and potency he conceived the medieval period in europe as a barbaric verity a rude stalwart age he did not realize what is more and more unfolding itself to all serious historians that the medieval period in europe was a civilization based upon a certain scheme of moral science of almost unexampled multiplicity and stringency a scheme in which the colors of a lackey's coat could be traced back to a system of astronomy and the smallest by-law for a village green had some relation to great ecclesiastical and moral mysteries it is remarkable that we always call a rival civilization savage the chinese call us barbarians and we call them barbarians the middle ages were a rival civilization based upon moral science to ours based upon physical science most modern historians have abused this great civilization for being barbarous carlyle had made one great stride beyond them in so far that he admired it for being barbarous but his fatal strain of intellectual impatience prevented him from getting on to the right side of catholic dogmas just as it prevented him from getting on to the right side of jacobin dogmas he never really discovered what other people meant by apostolic succession or liberty or equality or fraternity probably his few mistakes arose from his unfortunate tendency to find shams some have supposed this to be the essence and value of his message it was in truth its worst pitfall and disaster a man is almost always wrong when he sets about to prove the unreality and uselessness of anything he is almost invariably right when he sets about to prove the reality and the value of anything i have a quite different and much more genuine right to say that bull's-eyes are nice than i have to say licorice is nasty i have found out the meaning of the first and not of the second and if a man goes on a tearing hunt after shams as carlyle did it is probable that he will find little or nothing real he is tearing off the branches to find the tree i have said all that is to be said against carlyle's work almost designedly for he is one of those who are so great that we rather need to blame them for the sake of our own independence than praise them for the sake of their fame he came and spoke a word and the chatter of rationalism stopped and the sums would no longer work out and be ended he was a breath of nature turning in her sleep under the load of civilization a stir in the very stillness of god to tell us he was still there biographical note in a house which his father a mason had built with his own hands thomas carlyle was born on december fourth seventeen ninety five his mother margaret aitken a woman of the fairest descent that of the pious the just and wise was the second wife of james carlyle and thomas was the eldest of their nine children in the entepho of sartor resartus carlyle has pictured his native village it consisted of a single street 
down the side of which ran an open brook with amazement he writes i began to discover that intifo stood in the middle of a country of a world it was then that independently of schiller's willem tell i made this not quite insignificant reflection so true also in spiritual things any road this simple intifo road will lead you to the end of the world the room at arch house in which she was born now contains some interesting mementos on the mantelpiece are two turned wooden candlesticks a gift of john sterling sent from rome the table provides a resting place for his study lamp and his tea caddy most of the furniture came from cheney row carlyle came from ecclefeshan to attend edinburgh university when he was scarcely fourteen years of age and with a companion tom schmale journeyed the entire distance on foot they secured a clean-looking and cheap lodging in simon square a poor neighbourhood on the south side of edinburgh off nicholson street after residing in various parts of the old town carlyle removed in eighteen twenty one to better quarters and the most interesting of his various abodes in edinburgh was at one maury street now spay street leith walk here he commenced his literary work in earnest and began to regard life from a brighter standpoint leith walk is described in sartor resartus as the rue saint thomas de l'enfer all at once he writes there rose a thought in me and i asked myself what art thou afraid of it is from this hour that i incline to date my spiritual new birth or baphometric fire baptism perhaps i directly thereupon began to be a man it was at kirkley that carlyle first met edward irving the master of a rival school in the town they became intimate friends but for irving he says i had never known what the communion of man with man means it was here too that he made the acquaintance of miss margaret gordon the blumeen of sartor resartus carlyle describes the town in the reminiscences kirkley itself was a solidly diligent yet by no means a panting puffing or in any way gambling lang tun i in particular always rather liked the people though from the distance chiefly chagrined and discouraged by the sad trade one had in eighteen fifteen the carlyles moved to mainhill farm and here he first learned german studied faust in a dry ditch and completed his translation of wilhelm meister ten years later carlyle took possession of hodham hill farm his mother going with him as housekeeper and his brother alec as practical farmer here they remained until eighteen twenty six with all its manifold petty troubles says carlyle in the reminiscences this year at hodham hill has a rustic beauty and dignity to me and lies now like a not ignoble russet coated idol in my memory the abrupt termination of carlyle's tenancy of hodham hill occurred simultaneously with the expiration of his father's lease of main hill and in eighteen twenty six the family removed to scotsbrig that excellent shell of a house for farming purposes where carlyle's parents spent the remainder of their lives in this unpretentious home carlyle passed many restful holidays among his own people in the ancient county town of haddington he writes on july fourteenth eighteen o one there was born to a lately wedded pair a little daughter whom they named jane bailey welsh and whose subsequent and final name her own common signature for many years was jane welsh carlyle oh she was noble very noble in that early as in all other periods and made the ugliest and dullest into something beautiful i look back on it as if through rainbows the bit of sunshine hers the tears my own mrs carlyle in her early letters mentions her father's home at haddington where she was born it is my native place still and after all there is much in it that i love 
i love the bleaching green where i used to caper and roll and tumble and make elaine necklaces and chains of dandelion stalks in the days of my wee existence carlyle's marriage with jane bailey welsh took place on october seventeenth eighteen twenty six at templand where mrs welsh then resided the ceremony was of the quietest description his brother john carlyle being the only person present besides miss welsh's family for eighteen months after their marriage the carlyles lived at twenty one comely bank the trim little cottage far from all the uproar and prutescence material and spiritual of the reeky town the sound of which we hear not and only see over the no the reflection of its gaslights against the dusky sky it was during this time that carlyle contributed essays to the edinburgh and foreign quarterly reviews in eighteen twenty eight a removal was made to mr welsh's manor at craigan puddock where in the solitude almost druidical sartor resartus was written poor puttock he exclaims in one of his letters castle of many chagrins peat bog castle where the devil never slumbers nor sleeps very touching art thou to me when i look on thy image here in this lonely spot cut off from all social intercourse the carlyles remained until eighteen thirty four when after six years imprisonment on the dumfriesshire moor they moved to chelsea and took up their residence at number five cheney row in the house which was to be their home until death after a week's wearisome house hunting in london under the guidance of lee hunt carlyle sent a long description of the proposed new residence to his wife of which the following is an extract we are called Cheney Row, properly pronounced Cheney Row, and are a genteel neighborhood, two old ladies on the one side, unknown character on the other, but with pianos, as Hunt said. The street is flag-pathed, sunk-storied, iron-railed, all old-fashioned and tightly done up. The house itself is eminent, antique, wainscoted to the very ceiling and has been all new painted and repaired on the whole a most massive roomy sufficient old house with places for example to hang say three dozen hats or cloaks on and as many crevices and queer old presses and shelved closets as would gratify the most covetous goody rent thirty five pounds i confess i am strongly tempted the brightest and happiest part of carlyle's day was the early evening home between five and six with mud mackintoshes off and the nightmares locked up for a while i tried for an hour's sleep before my solitary dietetic altogether simple bit of dinner but first always came up for half an hour to the drawing-room and her where a bright kindly fire was sure to be burning candles hardly lit all in trustful chiaroscuro this was the one bright portion of my black day oh those evening half hours how beautiful and blessed they were the garden at cheney row was much appreciated by the carlyles who turned to the best advantage this poor sooty patch mrs carlyle writes behind we have a garden so called in the language of flattery in the worst of order but boasting of two vines which produced two bunches of grapes in the season which might be eaten and a walnut tree from which i gathered almost sixpence worth of walnuts here stood the quaint china barrels she often referred to as noblemen's seats but carlyle generally used one of the kitchen chairs by preference he found the garden of admirable comfort in the smoking way and sometimes in summer would have his writing-table placed under an awning stretched for that purpose and with a tray full of books at his side would work there when the heat drove him from his garret study the construction of this soundproof study was proposed as far back as eighteen forty three but not until ten years later was the enterprise put into practical execution 
on august eleventh eighteen fifty three carlyle wrote to his sister at length after deep deliberation i have fairly decided to have a top story put upon the house one big apartment twenty feet square with thin double walls light from the top etc and artfully ventilated into which no sound can come and all the cocks in nature may crow around it without my hearing a whisper of them the scheme looked promising on paper but the result was irremediably somewhat of a failure although the noises in the immediate neighborhood were excluded sounds in the distance evils that he knew not of in the lower rooms became painfully audible nevertheless he occupied the room as his study until eighteen sixty five and here whirled aloft by angry elements he completed what dr garnet named well his thirteen years war with frederick his writing-table and armchair stood near the centre and within easy reach was the little mahogany table for the books he happened to be using or such of them as were not on the floor carlyle bequeathed his writing-table to sir james stephen i know he wrote in his will he will accept it as a distinguished mark of my esteem he knows that it belonged to my father-in-law and his daughter and that i have written all my books upon it except only schiller and that for fifty years and upwards that are now past i have considered it among the most precious of my possessions it was into the ground-floor room at that time spoken of as the parlor that edward irving was ushered when he paid his one visit to cheney row in autumn eighteen thirty four i recollect writes carlyle in the reminiscences how he complimented her as well he might on the pretty little room she had made for her husband and self and running his eye over her dainty bits of arrangement ornamentations all so frugal simple full of grace propriety and ingenuity as they ever were said smiling you are like an eve and make a little paradise wherever you are no description of carlyle's chelsea home would be complete without mention of the kitchen where mrs carlyle made marmalade pure as liquid amber in taste and look almost poetically delicate and where too she stirred lee hunt's endlessly admirable morsels of scotch porridge readers of the letters and memorials will obtain many glimpses of this apartment and its occupants the fittings were very old-fashioned especially the open kitchen range with its kettle crane and movable niggards the dresser which stood there in eighteen thirty four remains against the south wall the table still stands in the centre and there is a sink in the corner beside the disconnected pump when carlyle was resting at dumfries after the exhaustion of his triumphant inaugural address upon his installation as lord rector of edinburgh university he received the announcement of his wife's sudden death whilst driving in her carriage in hyde park on april twenty first eighteen sixty six the effect of the calamity upon him was terrible there is no spirit in me to write he said though i try it sometimes mrs carlyle was buried in haddington church i laid her in the grave of her father writes carlyle in the reminiscences according to covenant of forty years back and all was ended in the nave of old abbey kirk long a ruin now being saved from further decay with the skies looking down on her there sleeps my little genie and the light of her face will never shine on me more the inscription on carlyle's tombstone is very simple the family crest two wyverns the family motto humilitate and then these few words here rests thomas carlyle who was born at ecclesfashion fourth december seventeen ninety five and died at twenty four cheney row chelsea london on saturday fifth february eighteen eighty one no monument writes frood is needed for one who has made an eternal memorial for himself in the hearts of all to whom truth 
is the dearest of possessions end of part two end of thomas carlyle by gilbert keith chesterton and john ernest hodder williams